this is Evan Marquette, dating coach for smart, strong, successful women and your personal trainer for love. Welcome back to the Love You Podcast, where you're going to learn everything there is to know about dating, relationships, sex, and men from a man's point of view. And today, we're going to be talking about how to stop men from walking all over you. Um, uh, and I want to begin with something that's, I guess, a little bit controversial. You never have to be a doormat. Lots of us have felt like doormats, but you really never have to feel like a doormat again because you're ultimately in control of how you are treated. Now, that is challenging because, well, we could all say, well, I was with someone and he did this and he did this and he did this and he did this and we could kind of run down a, a litany of things uh, and you'd be right about those things, right? I and mean, there's, there's all sorts of even cliches about it. You, you give a man an inch and he'll take a mile and all these stories about, about selfish, tone-deaf, clueless, cheating, lying men. And it, again, it may all be true, but... Here's the thing, you're making the choice to put up with it. That's, that, that's an inescapable and inconvenient fact. You're making the choice to put up with that guy who is uh, insensitive, verbally abusive, lying, cheating, etc. So to me, it's no different than if you have a job and you are horribly mistreated at your job or you're underpaid at your job or you're yelled at, at, at your job. Right? It doesn't mean it's good working conditions. No one's defending the working conditions, but your option is to quit your job. Right? Very few of us are 100% trapped in life. Obviously, if there's no possibility of ever getting another job, right, then no, you're going to have to stay at that job, but nobody stays at the same job for 50 years anymore. Similarly, in a relationship, right, unless, you're, unless you're actually married, where you're, you're, you, know, you, you share a bank account, you have kids together, where it's actually extricating yourself from the situation is, is more complicated. Breaking up with someone that you're dating is a 30-second conversation. So one can't claim that I can't help how I'm being treated. Um, it's easy to direct your ire at the men who are mistreating you. And again, I'm not defending those men. I, I'm saying that you have a lot more control over your destiny than a lot of us, you know, take credit for. Um, and I understand I am both the best and the worst messenger for this, um, for one main reason. I have never been a doormat. Um, uh, the closest I came to being a doormat was when I stayed in a six-month relationship with someone who broke up with me three times um, because she was a, she was very, uh, Jealous, and she didn't. She didn't like. She, you know, she came from a really uh, insecure background, polyamorous relationship, issues with weight. So she never really trusted me. Um, so she, she constantly uh, broke up with me. And I would say, Hey, I'm, I'm a good guy. Please take me back. And so that was the closest thing I ever came to being a doormat. And even in that situation, um, uh, the third time she broke up with me, it was, it was actually a pretty funny story. She, we were at a we went to a party. A friend of mine mentioned a friend's bachelor party in Las Vegas and how he went into the champagne room at the, at the bachelor party at the strip club or something like that. And that night when we were driving home, my girlfriend was giving me, and this is the one who dumped me twice before, she was giving me the silent treatment. And I said, what's going on? What are you angry about? And she said, you know, so-and-so, you know, your friend cheated on his wife. And I said, no, he didn't cheat on his wife. I mean, I've been to those kind of parties. He, he didn't do anything. He was in the champagne room for a half hour, but I could assure you he did not cheat on his wife. And when we got back to my place, she said, you know what? I can't do this anymore. Um, if, if your friends, right? And, and by the way, I wasn't at this bachelor party. If your friends are the kind of guys who are going to go to strip clubs for bachelor parties, I can't see you anymore. And I said, let me, let me just get this straight for the record. <laughs> I was with her at her aunt's 70th birthday party the weekend of this bachelor party. I, chose, I didn't go to my buddy's bachelor party because of her aunt's 70th birthday party. So I said, let me get this straight. You're breaking up with me over a bachelor party that I didn't even attend because my friends attended the bachelor party? She goes, well, I'm sure that's the way you're going to spin it. <laughs> I said, I'm pretty sure that's what's happening. I'm, I'm being dumped over, a, over a, a bachelor party. And, well, again, what was really 
concerning about that was that, that I loved her. I was crazy about this girl. She was so smart and so funny and so cool. And um, a couple weeks later when the smoke had cleared, she came back to me and said, hey, I know you're a good guy. I know this is, this is my issue. I'm trying really hard. Could we give it another shot? And, uh, and this is where I'm saying I was not a doormat. I said, you know what? <laughs> I would love to. I mean, I wish I could wave a magic wand and make you trust me, but I think you just need another guy who doesn't trigger you in the same way. Right? It's not, it's not personal, right? I, I, I'm not going to say that you're wrong for feeling the way you're feeling, but I'm not going to walk on eggshells the rest of my life uh, in fear that I'm going to do the wrong thing around you. So I think we, we both better part ways. So six months is the longest I've been with someone who fundamentally um, didn't, <laughs> didn't think very much of me. Um, but in that relationship, it was like 90, 95% good. It was just the 5% was unbearable. But uh, on the other hand, I, I have a bit of a dominant personality. So I do know what it's like to have the potential to treat a woman poorly. And I know I'm telling a lot of personal stories, but I don't have an app. I'm not going to put these personal stories in a, in, in a book or anything like that. There's no, there's no better place to tell them than on the Love You podcast. So I remember uh, I had a girlfriend who was delightful. Um, I really tend to think well of, of the people I dated, even if we didn't work out. She was, she was a, a social worker at L.A., city, you know, in, in, you know, inner city school district. And she lived a couple blocks away from me and she was Canadian and she was cute and she was sweet and she liked to read Us Magazine and she was just so affable and so agreeable and so sort of, and we've all been there on, on both sides of it, so instantly in love with me where I don't need someone who's a, a challenge. My current wife is not like a challenge. She's not difficult in any way. But with this, this woman I was dating, who again shall remain nameless, I felt like I would have too much power in the relationship. Like I could, like I could walk all over her if I chose to, because she just would give me a free pass on everything. And, um, I remember we were together for, it was, it was a month. I would dive into relationships back, back in the day in my early 30s. I would just dive into relationships really, really quickly. Oh my God, I really like you. I like you more than anybody else I've been seeing online. Let's give this relationship a shot. So I dive into a relationship with her, but there's someone else who has my heart. It was a woman that I had met in New York. And so I broke up with my Los Angeles girlfriend to give a shot to this woman in New York who is the complete opposite. This woman in New York is, was a powerhouse. She's, a, she's sassy. She's a personal trainer. She's fit. She hangs out with, with rich people and celebrities. Um, she's a, a, a superstar force of nature, and I was gaga for her. And so I flew to New York to go on a four-day date, and I spent the, 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 this long weekend with this woman. And at the end of the weekend, this woman tells me, essentially, <laughs> that I'm the equivalent of the... The, the nice girl I just dumped. She's like, I like you, but you're not, you know, I'm, you're not 100% for me. Like I need, I, I think I need a guy who's a little bit stronger <laughs> than you to keep up with me. So it was, it was a, a, the great irony that I dumped this lovely person um, who I was afraid was going to be a doormat. And then I found someone that I was so gaga about that I sort of became the equivalent of the puppy dog that she didn't quite respect. And so there's, there's a book that's, uh, that people talk about in relation to this doormat syndrome, and it's called Why Men Love Bitches. Um, I haven't read it. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you had. I've heard good things about it, so I'm, I'm certainly not putting it down. But what I understand from Why Men Love Bitches is that it's not really about being a bitch. Right? It's really just about setting boundaries and knowing what you will and you will not put up with. Right? There's no such, there's no truth to the idea that you have to do, be a bitch to do well with men. Uh, it's not true that that nice girl that I broke up with, the, the, the social worker, um, it, that she would be my wife if she was bitchier. <laughs> um, that's a, that's a, a terrible misnomer. I think it was the fact that she didn't have any opinions. She didn't have any boundaries. It's, and again, I can understand why this sounds like a contradiction because I know a big part of my coaching Right? And I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of it as I'm telling you is, hey, 
you want to be an easygoing, cool girl, right? You want to be the yes person. And it's true, right? People love easygoing yes people, but there is a limit. So again, making up these numbers, we could say, let's say yes, and, and I, I want to be the same way. Let's say yes 95% of the time. I say yes to my wife 95% of the time. Yes, dear. Whatever you want, dear. Whatever makes you happy, dear. This weekend, I'm pretty sure my wife is going wine tasting with her friends and I'm staying home with the kids or something like that. Yes, dear. <laughs> Whatever you want, dear. All right, that's, that's, that's the best path. But if I never had any opinions, if I never set any boundaries, if I never said no to anything, then it would almost be like I had no personality other than being a pleaser, right? It would put someone, someone so high up on a pedestal that it would be sort of unequal footing. So when we're talking about how to stop men from walking all over you, A, a big part of it is choosing a guy whose default setting is not to be dominant, right? There's people who have dominant personalities, but they're nice people or they're sensitive people. So you could find someone who has a lot to say, who has a lot of opinions, a lot of ambition, and a lot of drive, but that man still has to be sensitive to your needs and you have to let him know what your needs are. And that is ultimately incumbent upon you. We're going to talk a little bit more about this in the second half. I'm going to give you some rules to not being a doormat. My name is Evan Mark Katz. This is the Love You Podcast. We will be right back. Cats, Dating Coach for Smart, Strong, Successful Women, your personal trainer for love. Welcome back to the Love You Podcast. Uh, this episode is entitled How to Stop Men from Walking All Over You. Um, I'm not presuming that men are consistently walking all over you, but I think we've all had um, some time in our life where we were in a relationship that turned out a, a little lopsided or imbalanced. You felt like, yeah, you were the giver and you weren't receiving anything in return. And that's when it quickly turns into being a doormat. So, I want to begin by telling a story of a client of mine. She's in my, my Love You course. Uh, Love You is a six-month uh, video curriculum that teaches you everything you need to know about dating and relationships. And uh, I, there's an online community there where women post questions. Um, uh, they, they support each other. I, I monitor and uh, moderate that community and answer a lot of questions in there as well. And she was asking, uh, am I a doormat for putting up with a guy who is a lazy boyfriend and really and again he was a boyfriend um, he, she, she liked him he was treating her well um, he just wasn't calling and texting as much as he did at the beginning and she wasn't sure if she should speak up and this is uh, a, probably one of the more common dilemmas that are that are out there in relationship what level of effort and energy should one expect of a partner especially when you've reached a uh, level of of comfort, comfortable, comfortability. That's not really a thing, is it? Um, but then again, listen. The, the guy who buys you flowers, you know, every week for the first month, you can't expect him to be buying you flowers every week for for two years. I mean, there's probably a guy on earth who does it who makes the rest of us look bad. But you know, once you reach a certain level, what what is the comfort zone where both people are getting their needs met? And so, um, I made up a set of rules. These are not real rules. Anything that dating experts ever tell you, they're not real rules. They're just made up rules. But um, these are rules that will prevent you from being a doormat. Number one, you're giving against your own will. And again, then we're talking about the energy exchange in a relationship. So boyfriend is being, being a little lazy. He's not making the same effort that he did at the beginning. It's not terrible. It's just not satisfactory. All right. But when you're looking at, am I a doormat? You ask yourself, am I giving against my own will? Am I doing things that I don't want to do just for the sake of keeping the peace or trying to keep, keep my boyfriend? Like I'm afraid that if I stand up for myself, he's going to leave me. All right. um, the other night, my wife's family came to my house, extended family, cousins, came to my house with four kids. Uh, while I was working during the day, um, 
it's nice the cousins my kids they, they get to play with each other I knew that meant because they drove uh, three hours that they were going to spend the night for dinner uh, what I didn't know was that her cousin was going to get drunk and not be able to drive home so suddenly we had to take out uh, mattresses and all this kind of stuff and we had people sleeping all over our house and all over our floor <laughs> um, that's not an example of me being a doormat. It's a, it is an example of me trying to be a very patient husband and realizing that sometimes uh, in any relationship you're going to do things against your will. They're not going to be the way you want. But if you find yourself that you're consistently put upon and you're, you're, you're saying yes for the wrong reasons, mostly out of fear, um, yes, you are on the verge of becoming a doormat. Um, the next rule for not being a doormat is that you're giving just to make him love you. Um, giving should come from a genuine, unselfish place. Now, there's an argument that I've always talked about, like if if someone is on the side of the road and they're picking up trash in an orange jumpsuit or something like that, or, or is just picking up trash, does it matter if they're in an orange jumpsuit because the government is making them do it because they've committed a crime, or if they're just um, volunteering on a weekend to pick up trash at the side of the road, right? The end result is the same. They're, they're picking up trash. Um, but the truth is motivation does matter. Motivation matters a lot. And so there's giving something to my wife because I love her and I want to make her happy. And then it would be completely different if I felt like I was extorted. Oh my God, I have to buy her a diamond tennis bracelet because if I don't buy her a diamond tennis bracelet, she's going to complain to all of her friends about how cheap I am and she's going to leave me for a richer man. And that's a made up stupid example. But in, a, in, in, an, in another relationship, right, if, it, if it's you, and well, what are the things that you've given to men in spite of yourself, right, just to make him love you? And what are the things that you do, not because you just want to give, because you naturally want to make him happy and then it's extension of your personality, but it's things that you're giving just to make him stay with you because you're afraid he's going to leave you. If you are doing that, that's the wrong motivation. Right? You're not doing things out of the goodness of your heart. You're doing things out of fear, right? and you're on the verge of being a doormat. Number three, you're not a doormat unless he's unappreciative of your efforts. Right? Relationships are about giving, right? Mutual giving, right? That mutual admiration society, what I call the, the platinum rule, right? Give more than you receive. Be a better partner than your partner. If you always think of what you're going to give, you will inevitably receive in return, right? Inevitably is the wrong word for this very reason. Um, if you have a partner where you give, right? Out of the goodness of your heart, it feels good, but you don't really receive, you don't feel appreciated for the things that you give, well, now you've got a relationship in balance. And the answer is not to, this is where people get it wrong. A lot of women think the answer is to stop giving. I've seen it on my Facebook page all the time. I tell women to trust and to be givers and they'll come back with me. No, I have trusted. Right? I have to, I trusted men and I always gave and I gave and I gave and I gave and I gave and, and men, they just take and take and take and take. No, oh, that's the wrong man. Right, so the answer is not to be in a relationship with a guy, be a giver and say, huh, he's taking advantage of me. He's unappreciative. I make him breakfast every day. He doesn't care. I give him sex every night. He doesn't care. Right? So I'm going to stop making him breakfast and I'm going to stop giving him sex. That's the wrong reaction. It's an ineffective reaction. What you need is to not stop being a giver. <laughs> you need to find a new man who appreciates you. Right? If you have a boyfriend, husband who's unappreciative of your efforts, once again, you are on the verge of being a doormat. Right? And the answer is not to be less of a partner. You're already a great partner. Keep being a great partner. Find a man who's worthy and gives as much in return. Next, number four, you're not a doormat unless he constantly demands more of you. Right? Oh, you made me dinner tonight. Instead of being appreciative that you made him dinner, he says, why don't I have, why don't I have dinner on the table every night when I come home? <laughs> Right? And you're like, um, okay, I'll do that. I'm not saying you do that. But when you have a, a, a boyfriend who, when you know that you're a giver, you know that you're generous of spirit, you know that you're doing everything in your power to make this guy happy, and he's still complaining that you don't do enough, right? you're on the verge of being a doormat. And listen, that happens 
in relationships. As I said in previous episodes, we're all experts in what we give. All right? We're all experts in how we compromise. So I could tell you the story about how I shut up to host my wife's family for a night when her cousin got drunk, <laughs> right? pat myself on the back. What I don't know is necessarily how my wife sacrificed for me and didn't even bother to say a word about it. You can't be with a partner who's constantly demanding more of you and you don't want to be uh, lack self-awareness to the point where you think that you are the better partner and you're not appreciative of what your partner is giving you. Number five, you're not a doormat unless he doesn't give you anything in return. It sort of dovetails with things I've said earlier, but everybody deserves to be in a relationship with a giver, not a taker. A giver, not a taker. And if you find that you are the giver in the relationship, and it's fine if you're a warm, nurturing, caretaking kind of person, right? but that means your, your boyfriend, your partner has to take care of you in other ways in which you feel appreciated. Right? Some men give in terms of money, some men give in terms of quality time, right? words of affirmation, these are the five love languages. Right? So there's lots of ways that men give. You have to be satisfied in that relationship instead of staying in a relationship where once again, you don't feel that you are appreciated, appreciated or that you receive enough in return. In general, masculine is about giving, protecting, providing, doing. I'm gonna put up that shelf, I'm gonna carry that heavy bag, I'm gonna bring home the bacon, Right? That's, that's positive masculinity. You need a guy who gives to you in return. Finally, if you don't feel loved and appreciated, but you feel criticized, small, and trapped. Right? I can't tell you how many women I've talked to who have, who have been in relationships with men that they claim to love, who they claim to love them, and the default setting in their relationship is that they feel criticized, small, and trapped. You feel like you can never be good enough smart enough, nice enough, giving enough, right? And what you end up doing is just walking on eggshells around him, living in fear of upsetting him. I heard a horrible story um, recently of a friend of a friend who's been in a 20 year marriage uh, where she's, she's, now tempted, she's now tempted to leave but feels trapped um, because of money and a prenup. Um, but she's, she's been a doormat for 20 years and said, said nothing, just thought that this is reality, this is the way relationships are. And this guy's been this way from the beginning. Like everybody warned her about this guy, right? You know, before she went to the altar, her, the, her best friend and mom did an intervention and said, don't marry this guy. 20 years later, she's still with him and she still feels trapped. So being easygoing doesn't mean eating shit. It doesn't mean swallowing pride. It doesn't mean building up resentment. It means that you really don't care about the small stuff. Right? Letting go of the small stuff. My wife is an expert in letting go of the small stuff. She wrote about it in my book, Why He Disappeared. She gives me lots of mulligans. She forgives me for the things that I don't know that I'm even doing wrong because she sees me in the big picture as a good person who's flawed. Those are six, six ways in which you could feel yourself becoming a doormat. Um, I'm sure there's more, but the point is that you don't have to outline these sort of boundaries. You don't have to hand them to a guy on parchment and say, here, I'm not going to be a doormat. I'm following these rules, right? It's more of a way of being, right? The confidence to, to speak your mind. Uh, you don't have to make him wrong, right? People, and that's life is people test boundaries. My kids test my boundaries all the time. They see what they can get away with. And if they get away with it, right? Some, some parents let their kids, you know, stay up until, you know, midnight and eat candy and watch TV. And my kids don't even know that we have a TV. They think the TV is what we watch DVDs on. They don't know you could turn it on at any point in time and that there's 500 channels. So we have real boundaries. And I think um, that's what you have to have in relationships. Um, and there's entire books written on this. I think uh, there's someone named Henry Cloud. Uh, I think he's, he's, a, he's a Christian and he wrote a book called Boundaries. Um, but it's really just saying, here's what I'm willing to put up with. Here's what I'm not willing to put up with. I don't want to fight with you. I don't need to raise my voice, but you've crossed a line here. Um, I've had a client who had a boyfriend with serious mental health issues, right? He was a, he was a schizophrenic. Um, she was concerned about how that would affect her. Uh, eventually, she decided she, she couldn't deal with that because she dealt with uh, mental illness in her previous relationship. And she set a boundary. She said, I can't, you know, I can't deal with it anymore. She cut him off. Another, another client I've spoken about before, boyfriend wouldn't propose for five years, set a boundary, cut him off. Uh, another client who had a boyfriend whose family 
always took precedent. He was always trying to please his family, and he always made her second choice. Uh, she didn't cut him off, but she helped him reprioritize and say, hey, listen, if we're going to be part of a couple, right, you're either going to have to integrate me into your family or you're going to have to include me in part of the decision-making process. It can't just be, I'm going to you know, leave you to spend time with my family. Right? You have to sort of recalibrate your life when you're with a partner and run everything through your partner. That's a reasonable boundary. But that's a boundary you set without getting angry, without fighting, without saying you are A, X, Y, and Z. Um, often in arguments, let's face it, it's the person who pushes the hardest. Um, if there's one person who says, I will never lose an argument, I'm always going to win, well, that's where that adage, um, would you rather be happy or would you rather be right, comes from. Most of us would rather be happy, but sometimes we can't help it. We want to be right. We want to get our way. Well, if you're the person who always wants to get your way, your boyfriend is probably going to be the doormat. <laughs> if your boyfriend is the one who always wants to get his way, you're the one who's going to be the doormat. In good relationships, both, both parties could see the value of the other person's perspective and find ways to compromise, um, find ways to split the difference or agree to disagree so that there's really no doormatting going on. And I want to emphasize that being easygoing, which is l largely what we're talking about here, so it's sort of a counterpoint, right? It's, there's, there's being a doormat and being easygoing. Easygoing is closer to here than being a bitch, right? But it doesn't mean eating shit, swallowing pride, building up resentment. It just means you don't care about the small stuff, right? The wonderful book, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. It's, it's true. The, I think the, the one page that I remember from that entire book uh, that I once upon a time read on the toilet was, will this matter in one year? This thing that's upsetting me right now, is this going to bother me in a year? Is this important enough to raise my blood pressure, start a fight, open up a, a, a chasm between me and my partner over this thing that is so easily, easily going to be forgotten? The answer is rarely yes. My wife um, is great at this. She's my muse. My, uh, that's why she's my wife. Um, and she's gotten on my case for not listening. Uh, we could joke about it. She calls it a, a man listen. Right. There's a man listen, there's a man look. I can't find my keys. She's like, you did a man look, you, didn't you? You looked for like a half a second and then said, honey, where's my keys? Uh, a man listen is that he listens to 50% of what you say and misses the other 50%. He just doesn't know which 50% is important. But she's mentioned this to me on occasion, that she tells me important things and I'm not completely attuned to what she's saying. And she's right. right. And this is the happiest, easy easygoingest, least critical woman in the entire world. And she's 100% right. I'm not a great listener. And um, if I denied this, if I acted like, don't, don't be so critical, you're being crazy, I listen to you. If I, if I basically told her what she's experiencing isn't true, she wouldn't have a very good husband on her hand. All right? So she sets the boundary. I'm not going to be perfect in the future, but I'm going to do my best to listen to her and respect the fact that her observation, the fact that she's bringing up is real. And this is why my happy, easygoing wife is, is nobody's doormat. Um, the good thing about this is that all these qualities that we're talking about, they, they unearth themselves before you get married, right? If you're dating someone for two years, this isn't going to sneak up on you. We talked about this in a previous podcast about how to avoid a bad relationship. These seeds are planted and you watch them grow. And if you see someone through a couple of life cycles, right? Two full trips around the sun, family holidays, moving in together, going through ups and downs, careers, friends, health. You will get to really see who someone is. Um, and if you find that you are either in a position of being a doormat, either because it's your natural setting, right? Or you're with a guy who is a steamroller, He's the guy who turns everybody into a doormat because he's so dominant and insensitive. You have the ability to change your script. Just because it's always been that way doesn't mean it has to continue to be that way. From now on, you have the tools to choose better men, nicer men, more sensitive men. Right? And don't complain that he's too nice, he's too sensitive. Right? Again, you don't have to be with a guy who's a pussy, forgive my language, but you could be with a guy who puts you first, thinks of your needs, doesn't steamroll you, doesn't put you in the position of being weak or needy or resentful or walking on eggshells. Right? You can be treated right without any of the drama. 
right? But it's up to you. Your actions are going to determine your future as to whether you're going to be someone else's doormat uh, in a relationship. I sincerely hope that you are not. Thank you so much for joining me here on the Love You Podcast. My name is Evan Mark Katz, and on the next episode, we are going to be talking about a juicy topic, men and money. You don't want to miss it. If you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. Follow me on Facebook and Twitter, and please go to www.evanmarkkatz.com, where I'm going to give you free dating and relationship advice every day until you don't need any more dating and relationship advice because you're happily married. Sound good? I think so. Thank you so much for your time. I'll talk to you soon.